King George III was a stubborn, foolish ninny, right? Stuck in his ways as protest in America finally exploded into the revolution. Even today, we see George mincing across the stage in the musical Hamilton, a silly caricature of a monarch. But in fact, George was shrewder, more complex, and more intriguing than we often acknowledge. He was king for 60 years, from 1760 to 1820, having ascended the throne at the age of 22. He reigned at the end of the Seven Years' War in 1763, when victory over France and Spain created the first British Empire, with enormous territorial gains in Canada, the West Indies, and half a billion acres in America between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River. He matured into a steadfast king and an admirable man, diligent, dutiful, habitually moderate, peevish but rarely bellicose. He was frugal in an age of excess, pious at a time of impiety. His interests ranged from physics and theology to horticulture and astronomy. His 65,000 books would stock the British National Library. He was a devoted family man, unlike many monarchs of his day. In 1761, he chose an obscure, drab German princess, sight unseen to be his queen, and married Charlotte in St. James's Palace six hours after her arrival in London. She had learned to play God Save the King on the harpsichord. He had the marriage bedroom decorated with 700 yards of blue damask and large basins of goldfish. The happy union proved fertile. She produced children with lunar regularity, eventually to number 15. The three requirements of an English king came easily to him, to shun Roman Catholicism, to obey the law, and to acknowledge parliament. Under reforms adopted in the 17th century, he could not rule by edict as an absolute king, but rather needed the cooperation of his ministers and both houses of parliament. He saw himself as John Bull, the frock-coated, commonsensical embodiment of Britain, while acknowledging that I am apt to despise what I am not accustomed to. And truth be told, George despised disorder and he loathed disobedience. He had an inflexible attachment to his own prejudices, with, as one biographer later wrote, the pertinacity that marks little minds of all ranks. His mulish disposition also aligned with sincere conviction. In his view, the empire, so newly congealed after the Seven Years' War, must not melt away. Why would Britain fight for eight years across 3,000 miles of Atlantic Ocean in the age of sail in a costly, bloody, failed effort to keep the American colonies from gaining independence? What were they thinking? Why was the king so obstinate? George and his ministers made three critical miscalculations. One, that most American colonists remained loyal to the crown, notwithstanding troublemakers in New England capable of inciting a rabble. Two, that firmness, including military firepower if necessary, would intimidate the obstreperous and restore harmony. And three, that failure to reassert London's authority in America would eventually unstitch the newly created British Empire, encouraging insurrections in Ireland, Canada, the Caribbean, and India. This was an 18th century version of the domino theory that would propel America into Vietnam two centuries later. George had never traveled outside of England, and none of his ministers had been to America. There was a great deal they did not know about the two and a half million subjects who lived there. And we can see that perhaps George's tragic flaw was a lack of empathy and imagination in trying to understand who those distant people were and what they aspired to become. In the King's view, shared by his cabinet and a strong majority in Parliament, British wealth and status derived from her colonies they simply must not be allowed to slip away. And so George's heart had hardened. To his prime minister, Lord North, he wrote, the line of conduct seems now chalked out. Blows must decide. 
On sale now, The British Are Coming, Rick Atkinson's epic story of the American Revolution. Available from the shops at Mount Vernon or wherever books are sold.